So today we're on part seven of Change Without Shame, and uh, we've been talking about God's transformational kind of change in his power in our lives in that way, and we're looking at some of the practical aspects of how we actually realize that in our life, how it comes to, to be. And um, just kind of as a disclaimer, whenever we get into um, any aspect of the Christian faith that uh, involves any effort on our part, um, it can arise questions of works righteousness and of uh, legalism. Now, nobody has said that to me as we've been talking about this, so I'm not responding to anything. But I think it's really good for us to wrestle with that thought because the church throughout history has really made some bad errors in this area. For example, um, even today, some people believe that when we sin, uh, we have to do something to make that right. It's called penance. And in the late Middle Ages, that whole thinking got really out of hand. In fact, um, it got so out of hand that they began to sell people forgiveness in the form of these things called uh, indulgences. <laughs> she does not want to be in here, <laughs> poor thing. Um, they began to sell what they call in indulgences, and they believed that Jesus and the saints had so much extra righteousness um, that they could kind of reappropriate that righteousness to those who needed to get out of purgatory or whatever. Um, and, and so as they, they could give it to you if you did something for it, um, including and up to paying money for it. Now, obviously, that's against what the Bible teaches about grace and, and salvation. So this whole mess is what triggered Martin Luther to write his 95 Thesis um, in the year 1517 and nail it on the door of a, of a castle um, in Wittenberg, Germany. And that was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. So just a super quick history lesson, for those of you who aren't already aware of this, um, that was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. So they were protesting to reform, Protestant Reformation. Well, Luther wasn't just uh, protesting the, the abuse of, of, you know, making money to sell forgiveness. He was protesting the whole understanding of, of God's grace. Now, um, that's what Jesus did. Think about it. When you read the Gospels and you read the story of Jesus, what was he doing? He was reacting against the religious leaders because they were abusing their power and they were um, actually putting man-made hurdles for people to get to God. And Jesus did not like that. It ticked him off. I mean, he was turning over tables and stuff, right? So Luther did this, a similar thing. And you know what? The inspiration for Luther was Paul's writings. So most of Paul's writings was about this. It was about this error of thinking that you can earn God's grace or you can earn your way to heaven and didn't really need God's grace, right? So keep that in mind when you read books like Galatians, Ephesians, Romans, Philippians, um, any of the 13 books that, that Paul wrote. So Paul was constantly warning about this error. Luther, Luther reformed the church because of that error, and it really was a big thing that Jesus took a stand on, right? On the other hand, though, 
There were many points in church history where being a Christian meant squat. It was just like being like a citizen of a country. You were born into it or whatever, or you had to jump through certain hoops to earn that title of citizen. In fact, many times throughout history, church and state were connected like that. Did you know that's why the United States has separation of church and state? A lot of people kind of protest that, believers, they don't like that. But really, a theocratic government has a lot of pitfalls. So, um, the church could have been, like, there could have been, all, look at this picture, there's like, everywhere you look, there's a church, right? Religion may have been flourishing, but honestly, the kingdom of God was not. And, and I think in a big way, this is the condition of the church today in the West, is we have a form of, form of godliness, but we deny the power. Somehow we believe, because of the message of grace, that what we do doesn't matter. Well, this is the context of the writing of the book of James. James was writing to people who believed the grace message, who received the grace message, but it wasn't reflected at all in their lifestyle or even their beliefs from what we can tell. So we have Paul on the one hand who was responding to people who were using and abusing the law for their own gain and for power. That's who Paul was responding to in much of his writing. And then we have James, who's responding to people who received the message of grace and it resulted in literally just no change in anything. It's like, oh, I'm saved and nothing else matters. That's why in the Bible we can see passages like these. From James, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Did you ever even realize that was in there? A man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And then from Paul, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in case there's any question about whether or not they're talking about the same thing, here are the main words in Greek. They are the exact same words. There can be no question that Paul and James were talking about the same thing, but from what appears to be opposing viewpoints. But they're not opposing viewpoints if you look at it correctly. I know it seems like a contradiction, but it really, it's a resolvable paradox. And to demonstrate that, um, I want to use an example that I used from, uh, that I learned from a, uh, an astrophysicist. Now, he wasn't using it this way, but I'm going to. A triangle cannot be a circle. A triangle can be a circle. So just like those statements we just looked at from Paul and James, these appear to be a contradiction, right? I mean, how can they both be true? But let's take a closer look. Here's a triangle. This is a two-dimensional triangle, so it has a height dimension and it has a width dimension. And now there doesn't seem to be any way that that image could be both a circle and a triangle at the same time. Would you agree? Good. Just checking to see if you're awake. But if we add one spatial dimension and, and have a depth to this thing, then we can locate the axis of it. And if we open it up, if we curl it open, then we have a cone. Well, now we have a triangle that is at the exact same time a circle. So our seemingly contradictory statements are resolved. 
they can both be true at the same time. Would you agree? Yes. Kind of cool. Now, in the same way, I'm not trying to teach you about geometry. I'm, I'm just actually uh, trying to make a point that these statements from James and Paul, even though they seem like they contradict each other, actually all we have to do is look at them correctly. Remember who Paul was talking to. He was talking to people that thought they could earn salvation. And he's saying, you can't. That's why he says what he says. But James is talking to people that have accepted that message of grace, yet it isn't reflected in their behavior at all. Now, James isn't saying that we can be justified by the law because then we'd have a real contradiction, but he's not saying that. So my point is that throughout the history of the church, um, we've had to avoid these two errors, these two extremes. These aren't the extremes. The, it's the misinterpretation of these two kind of passages that are the extremes that, that result in those two errors, right? So, would you agree that Jesus is not only our Savior, but he's our Lord? Hmm. So that means we really should do what he says. Because if we don't do what he says, then the kingdom of God is not in you. What? Well, you've read passages like that, haven't you? Well, think about it. What's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the will of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, where his will is perfectly done. Well, if we don't do God's will, then the kingdom is not there. Do you see it? Very, very important to understand. The kingdom of God is where the king rules and where the king reigns. Does he rule and reign in your life? Not about salvation. It's about the kingdom. Now, we see these kind of tensions in all, over the, all over the New Testament and just in practical and spiritual matters. We see those kind of tensions. I call that the push-pull dynamic of the enemy. Push-pull. This is what I mean by that. So maybe he's pushing you and he's going... Wow, you're really not a good Christian. You're, you're a bad person. You have bad behaviors. You, you have bad things going on. I saw what you were looking at on the internet the other day. You, know, you need to get your life right with God or you're going to go to hell. And then you walk around constantly trying to do uh, what you're supposed to do, which in itself is good. You should try to do what you're supposed to do. <coughs> Excuse me. But what happens is the enemy gets behind you and he starts pushing. You got to perform. You got to perform. You got to do right. You got to obey all the rules. You got to, you know, all the while the enemy knows that it's actually impossible for you to meet the standard that God set, which is perfection. Be holy as I am holy. He knows that's impossible. In fact, he knows that in our flesh, we're incapable of performing any right action for any length of time. And then maybe you are at church and a preacher preaches a message of grace. Or maybe you're reading your Bible and you read the passage that says, for it is by grace that you have been saved, not by of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. And then you go, oh, yes. And you experience the freedom of the lifting of that law or the release of the pressure of that pushing. But what we miss so often at this point is that then the enemy just changes his tactics. Instead of trying to push you into works, 
He tries to pull you out of obedience. Both of which are errors. Both of them are errors. But we hear the voice of the enemy going, you're free. You don't have to pay attention to the rules anymore. You can do whatever you want because you're saved by grace. Forgetting that freedom isn't a lack of restriction. It's applying the right restrictions. We don't liberate a fish by removing it from water. In order for a fish to be free, he has to be restricted to the water. That's what obedience is, you guys. It's keeping us in the realm where we can flourish and survive. Now, the tricky part of this whole dynamic is this. There are truths in both of those errors. All the most powerful lies have truth woven into them or we wouldn't even succumb, right? The best lies have a lot. The more truth that's, you know, there only has to be one little seed of a lie in order to bring destruction. But we have to avoid this push-pull syndrome, this push-pull dynamic. And uh, both of them are bad. So how do we avoid it? That's the whole point. It's leading up to this. How do we avoid the error on both ends of the spectrum? Well, I believe it's by occupying the space that I call the radical middle. The radical middle. I call it radical because us people, we, we very seldom occupy this space. We are prone to taking sides, to polarizing. We do it in our politics. We do it in our relationships. We do it in our theology. We polarize. We're not good at taking the middle ground. Whoever's not on our side, we demonize them. They're on the other side. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when we need to take a side. There are some things we really need to take a side on. But the point is that um, we're not good at at avoiding extremes. We are prone to extremes. We have to be very careful not to fall into those ruts. So what are the extremes that we're talking about? Well, on the one side, it's legalistic, it's harsh, it's judgmental, it's demanding. On the other side, it's apathetic, it's licentious, meaning that we just do whatever we want. We have a license to sin. It's self-centered and it's fruitless. Neither of these paths are good, obviously. So what's the radical middle? What is it? Well, you remember last week when I was talking about what is the goal or the destination of change without shame? How do we know if we actually are a disciple? When can we say we are experiencing transformation? Do you remember what I said? Love. It's love. And love is the radical middle. Love is the radical middle. Isn't it crazy how so much of what we talk about comes back to this? It comes back to love. That's why Jesus said, the greatest commandment is this, love. He said that all of the law and all of the prophets 
hang on these two things. Love God and love each other. It all hinges on that. It's all centered on that. Love. Because if we do that, all the other stuff follows. Think about it. Run through the Ten Commandments in your head. Well, if I'm loving, I'm not going to murder. If I'm loving God, I'm not going to serve another God. I'm not going to envy. I'm not, I, you're not going to do those things, right? All of the commandments, all of the prophets hang on love. So how does love occupy that radical middle space? Well, since love is... Uh, inherently relational, let's look at it through that lens because we all have relationships and we can all kind of, we can all think about it from that place. There are two negative extremes that we typically go to um, in our relationships and they are attack and withdraw. Those are the extremes that we're prone to, attacking and withdrawing. So either we can try to, you know, I mean, think about like if you're in a relationship and some tension happens with your spouse or a really close friend or a family member, what's our reaction? Well, we get angry. We can even hate. We could yell. We could, if, if it's bad enough, we're going to get mad and do something physical, like throw something at them or take a swing or whatever, that's attack. That's the attack side. But on the other side, what do we do? We shut down. Instead of yelling, maybe we give them the silent treatment. I'm just not going to talk to you anymore. Maybe you get in your car and drive away, which is actually a good thing. If, if you're going to attack, driving away is better than attacking. But if it's to punish the other person, then that's the withdrawal. That's the negative side. Hmm. You create space. Get away from me. I don't even want to look at you. <laughs> Maybe you even stop caring. Now, notice how the descriptions of attack and withdraw fit with the other extremes that I were talking about. They fit like a glove, don't they? Now, to clarify one point, very important, I'm not saying that there's a balance between works and grace. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that love fulfills everything. Love fulfills everything. Love is the way that things were always meant to be. It's not just the cure for the extremes. It's the original rightness. Hmm. All these extremes that we're looking at here, they're just counterfeits for what God always intended to be. Love, the radical middle. So when we talk about change without shame, we're talking about changing from the broken paradigms of the world to the way God always intended it to be. Love. Love is the meaning of the universe. It's the reason he created the universe. Love is. Now, a few people have said to me, over the years, one of them recently, that um, I'm afraid that I'm going to lose myself in this whole transformation process, that I'll no longer be me and that I'm going to lose who I really am, you know, because our culture has such a high value on, oh, I can see who you are when you sing that song or whatever, you know, I can really see you in that. But you will never know you until you know you 
through the eyes of God. He made you. He gets you better than you get you. And the reason we have a world walking around trying to find themselves is because of this. They don't know who they are in God. So they don't know who they are. So they're lost. So any glimpse of who I am is thrilling. And I don't mean to mock that because maybe they are seeing a real glimpse of, of who they are. Now, switching gears a little bit, I just want to give you the, uh, a quick, simple tool um, that we can use in order to walk in this radical middle. So let's go back to our triangle. A couple years ago, I read a, a book by a guy named Mike Breen, who's an expert on discipleship. And he said, you know, if you want people to remember things, um, use shapes. Use shapes, because they remember the shapes. That's one of the reasons that I used the triangle and the circle before, not that he is using that or the astrophysicist, astrophysicist gave me permission to use it that way, but that's what I do. Just, just use it however I want to use it. <laughs> All right. So this one is a triangle, and it helps us remember the, the three parts of healthy discipleship, which are up, in, and out. Up is an aspect of loving God, love God, and then love your neighbor, and in and out are an aspect of loving our neighbor as ourselves. So Jesus modeled all three of these things perfectly throughout the New Testament. When you read about him, you see that he was constantly going up, he was constantly going in, he was constantly going out. And what I mean by that is up is, like we see several places in the New Testament where Jesus would pull away from the crowds, right? He would like get in a boat and run away from them. He would even pull away from his really close friends and he would get alone with the Father for the purpose of praying, from hearing from the Father. It says that Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I believe this is where he saw what the Father was doing. He pulled away. He was reconnected with the Father in his humanness. Obviously, he was one with God, but he was a human. So he had to, he had to do this. Constantly refueling, constantly reconnecting. I love this quote. Prayer was as fundamental an element in the life of Jesus as breathing. He inhaled the Father's presence so that he could exhale his Father's will. Oof. Such a powerful quote. Listen, if Jesus, the Son of God, thought that it was necessary for him to pull away from all the stuff of the world, and get alone with the Father, how much more important is that for us to do? The up aspect of our walk with God is essential. I would go as far as to say that the up aspect is our walk with God. It is our walk with God. And then Jesus went in. And what I, what I mean by in is that, um, is this. We gather, like think about Jesus. He had this group of friends that he did life with. They ate together. They served God together. They traveled together. They talked about spiritual matters together. They did life together. It was from the place of that relationship that Jesus had impact on their lives. That's what this is. We have impact on each other's lives by spending time together. And there's a really frequently overlooked aspect of this that I want to point out real quick. Conflict. Conflict is one of the biggest blessings in relationship that we usually don't think of as a blessing. It's something that we tolerate so we can get to the good stuff. 
party, play games, whatever, hang out, have fun. You listen to me talk. That's my favorite part. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but conflict, I mean, how do we grow? Suffering leads to perseverance and perseverance to character. So when we go through things together, when we disagree and we fight for that relationship, we become better. It builds our character. It brings change without shame as long as we're not attacking or withdrawing. See that? And finally, out. This is just the aspect of making a, about more than just us four and no more, you know. Jesus and his followers were constantly ministering to the lost. They were healing the sick. They were feeding the hungry. They were delivering the demonized. But most importantly, they were inviting people into the work of the kingdom. They were inviting people into the will of God where all of those other things can happen. Jesus said, come and follow me. Follow me. Follow me. So through these three things, Jesus and through his followers radically changed the world. They brought change without shame. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word that constantly astounds us, that constantly ignites our, and excites our minds. And we pray that you would help us to live this, God, that there would be no guilt and pressure and pushing, but that we wouldn't just relax into lethargy. We wouldn't be pulled into disobedience. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. We surrender ourselves to the radical middle, and we ask that you would be made real in us and through us. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen. Amen.